host for this show, American Dreams, the Sky is the Limit, is Jin Kyu So Robertson. Tonight's guest is Mick Quinn, the best selling author of the major work on soul consciousness development, The Uncommon Path. Please join me to welcome Mr. Mick Quinn. Hi, Mick, welcome. Hi, Jin Kyu, thank you very much, and <laughs> it's my, my pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, uh, I'm honored to have you on my show, and uh, you are from Guatemala right now, right? I'm calling from, I'm sitting outside enjoying the evening here. It's a beautiful, oh. a beautiful day in Guatemala. I've never been there, but one of these days I'm sure I will be there. But uh, yes. you said that the music we played, that the beautiful music, you know, that I was uh, uh, listening with my eyes closed and I could see the butterfly and the rainbow and waterfalls and flowers and uh, you said it was written by uh, someone you know? Yes, uh, Jessica Roma, sure. She is a, a pianist and an educator, and, and uh, she is one of our sponsors. We, we have a foundation here called the Integral Heart Foundation that's running in Guatemala, and one of the projects that we work on is supporting uh, children and their, their education, and Jessica sponsored this girl called Cassie. Kathy is 14, and as a gift for Kathy, uh, she wrote this, uh, that, that musical piece for her specifically. And you said uh, Jessica Salinici is? Uh, Chopin and Beethoven, all the way back. How about that? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's, she's, quite a, she's quite a pianist. She's, she's, um, she's based in Massachusetts, and she can be found at pianobeautiful.com. Wow. Yeah. Maybe one, you know, maybe one of these days, and she could be on my show, too. <laughs> oh, perhaps I can I can cross your cross your lines and see what happens. Yeah, you never Absolutely. know, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, before we talk about your work and uh, you have such an interesting life story too and uh, uh I'm kind of interested in uh, your life in Ireland before you left for America and uh, uh, just to tell us so uh, you know what what made you move to America. You know, I, I think it all began when I was when I was in my my let's say ten or twelve years old. We used to watch uh, on on a black and white television. There was a show called uh, it was an early light version of MTV, and it was a music show that was hosted by an Irish uh, video DJ who was based in New York City, and it was on oh. Sunday afternoons for two hours. And I remember we used to sit there and watch the the music but he would he would like introduce the show from the streets of new york wow. and it was so amazing to see such a huge place because ireland in the 70s was was you know it was a, it was a small rural country and and it, it was so intriguing to see that there were other places around the world that were just so different so i i think it began there and then of course you know i went to college and i got a job and you know i did all the things that i was supposed to do my parents said you know get a good degree or go to college and then get a job and you know everything will work out and i remember being somewhat dissatisfied with life in general when, when i was you know in in my in my early 20s because there really wasn't much opportunity. And, and then what started happening was a lot of my friends started to emigrate. And my brother actually left Ireland about three months before I did. And oh. he sent back this, this photograph once of him. And it was just a photograph of him sitting on the hood of a car in a oh. parking lot. But there was something about the quality of the blue in the sky. Wow. If you can believe that. And I was really attracted by this. It just seemed to have this very open, boundless kind of energy, and, and I said, you know, i got to go see that. And uh -huh. I, I think that was really what made up my mind, because it was, <laughs> it was difficult, as you can probably attest, oh, to yeah. leave your family and your culture and everything that you're used to in your social circles and move to a completely new um, country. And so, you know, it was, it was challenging, but I think that's, that's where it began. And, of course, as I said, many of my friends were leaving, and they were coming back with great, great stories of America and how easy it was to get on and how much opportunity there was. So that, that, that's where it all began in, in 86, 85, 86. Hmm. Where, well, where was that blue sky which, you know, kind of allured you into America? Uh, that blue sky was in, that, that, that was a, uh, uh, an early summer's day in, in Massachusetts. Oh, place, Massachusetts. Yeah, a place called Cape Cod. <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah. You could have amazing, you know, blue sky up there. I, I oh, was yeah. Up, yeah, up that area for, for a while anyway. And uh, so you are, you are very, you are very, I mean, you are still, you know, very successful in America and uh, so were you surprised to what you found in America? Or? 
Um, I, I was surprised with number one. I think at how how big everything was. I was even uh-huh. surprised at the, at at the fact that they had air conditioning. I, I remember when I got off the plane in July of '86 and in, in, at JFK Airport, and everybody was wearing shorts and t-shirts, but the place was freezing cold, and I couldn't believe how cold it was in America in July. <laughs> and I also couldn't believe how how people were wearing shorts and, and t-shirts, but the, I didn't realize till I got outside, you know, how hot it was in July in New York City. <laughs> Yeah, so that's kind of an example of like a surprise, but I, I, again, I was I was surprised at at you know number one how how large it was and and also the distances that people had to cover, but also the fact that if you really applied yourself, you could really do well. I mean that, yeah. that emerged very quickly. There were just limitless opportunities, mm-hmm. and and um, you know as I said, if you worked hard, it was it was quite easy to make it. Yeah, that's the, the beauty of America. And so what you are doing right now? I mean, the, your work? Well, the work right now is, is we're, we're here in Guatemala. We've been here for almost a year. Um, the book released last year in, in the States, well, worldwide, and uh, we made number one in two categories on Amazon. And wow. we decided to it, – it's kind of in its seeding phase now, and we're, you know, we're getting some nice accolades around the world from, from, uh, from people who are reading the book. And it's kind of in its seeding phase, so we kind of have to leave it. It's like a child when it learns how to walk. It needs to figure out its own feet, you know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So we we decided to um, to move down here because my wife is from Spain, so we really like the Spanish culture when we lived in Europe, and um, we we've been working with the with the Integral Heart Foundation down here and uh, working at, at different schools. We work we have a solar project. Um, it's a portable solar unit that um, allows these very poor people to have light at night because they've been using candles. We have a program for building leaders where we use uh, coaching techniques from the states to help the leaders of the schools. And uh, we're starting also starting an integral school for the kids, an after-school program that's coming up next year. So we have lots, lots of work going on down here. Yeah. And so, so how did you end up doing what you're doing now, though? Well, after I, when, when I moved to the States, we were, you know, I- illegal for, for seven years. We didn't have papers, so it was kind of a precarious uh, situation mm-hmm. at times. But that you didn't, didn't come as an immigrant? Oh yeah, yeah. We I, I came on a holiday visa and just overstayed. Oh my God! <laughs> oh yeah, wow. for seven years, seven years. Oh my God! And we won. I, I th- in those days they were giving out visas in those lotteries. In 1993, I got a I got a visa, and mm-hmm. right about the same time, I had started studying meditation. And my meditation teacher was a businessman from New York. He was in computer software development, and he said. Now that I had my green card, he said, move to New York, go back to college, and get into technology. And so that's what I did. So I actually had started a business in the Boston area, which I sold to my manager, and, and that uh-huh. provided me with enough cash to kind of survive in New York. And, and I think it was very soon after I moved, maybe two or three months, I heard about this business opportunity with uh, two people who were in my meditation class who were starting a business at the World Trade Centers doing software development and headhunting um, Consulting, and um, I joined them, and you know we worked without salaries for six months, and just you know making phone calls, and that was the first company that grew into that uh, thirty-five million dollar operation after uh, about three years. So that was my first dip into, you know, the the American dream. So I'm you know working at the towers, living down on Wall Street, and then I ended up living on Central Park South, and eventually on Fifth Avenue. And you know life was life was really good in those days. And from that I went to start my own separate company after that and then I started a coaching practice and I started an import business and then was when I I was really I kind of had a foot in two worlds more in the spiritual world and also in the business world and that's when the idea came to maybe blend some of these business ideas with spirituality and you know the experiences that I had over those years to produce the uh, the uncommon path Wow. Have you ever thought, you know, when you left Ireland that you would be involved in spiritual work? I had no idea. If you, if you, <laughs> had, if you had even suggested that, that I'd be running a non-profit foundation in, in Guatemala, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> after having lived in six different countries, no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, we have about just one minute left for, to end the second uh, segment, and... Uh, so what does, what do your uh, family in Ireland say about what you're doing now? 
Oh, they love it. I mean, I, I, I was the oldest, so they kind of looked up to me as, as you know, the, setting the good example. I'm, I'm not sure if I've done that, but, um, but two of my brothers have their own business back home now, so I, we, you know, I've worked with them over the years to help them uh, get that business started. And my mom is, she, she, I mean, she's very happy. She, my mom is even sponsoring one of the little girls here too. So, oh. I mean, they're, 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 they're thrilled, and, um, you know, we, 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 we visit there as often as we can. So we, I have the full, the full support, and they know I'm a little bit crazy, but I think you have to be if you're gonna, if you're gonna step out and make it, right? You know that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a time for another short station break. So when we come back, we will continue on uh, learning about this, uh, the shadow and values and whole nine yard about uh, your work. Okay. Welcome back, Mick. Thanks, Jin. Good to be here again. Uh huh. And we were talking about Guatemala, actually. But uh, you know, uh, before I ask you the reason, could you name three individuals you consider as influences for your work and uh, yourself? Uh, absolutely. And and you know, this is a part of what uh, one of my goals with the Uncommon Path was was to bring into what I would call mainstream awareness our these teachings and technologies that have emerged in human consciousness over the last, say, 20 to about 50 years. And the, the number one there is a, in, is a man called Ken Wilber, who's an American philosopher who's based in Denver. He's written about 26 books in 57 languages over the last 30 years. And wow. he has created a world philosophy called Integral Theory. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the theories that I, I, I um, expound on in the book and, and integrate to the other teachings in, in a very practical way, actually, because it's, it's an amazing map that helps us look at ourselves and our, our potential. The, the second influence is uh, a teacher called Andrew Cohen, who is a teacher of evolutionary enlightenment who's based in Massachusetts. And the third is an individual called Genpo Roshi, who is a Zen master in uh, both Rinzai and Soto schools in Japan, He's based in Salt Lake City, and he's an American, and he created this process called the Big Mind Process, which is a process that allows us to uh, deal with our own shadows and also become what he calls a fully functioning human being. So these are the, the, the three individuals and teachings that are, are combined in, uh, along with some, some other processes in the Uncommon Path. And again, in a, in a very simple way, but they help us really uh, discover uh, ways to express our, our full potential for the sake of ourselves and also for the sake of uh, humanity. And, you know, what practice do you consider essential for those? Oh, I would say the first would be meditation absolutely essential if, if anyone's interested. And, and this is not, if, even if a person is not terribly spiritual or even if they don't have very high spiritual aspirations, even, I mean, I remember working in New York, we were meditating the whole time that we were, that we were starting these businesses, and I found it tremendously beneficial to be able to sit and just be with the mind and let the mind go calm. And it, it brought great clarity to business decisions, to planning, to even hiring and running a business. So that, I would say, is, is a very essential uh, practice and, you know, very simple to do, no experience necessary. <laughs> and uh, the second would be the topic of shadow. Now, shadow are these let's say these recurring emotional states or these recurring patterns that we tend to get stuck in and we can't seem to get out of and often they will destroy uh, our peace of mind, maybe even our relationships, or even the goals that we have set for ourselves. So this is a, a, a shadow practice that I, I think is also essential. So those two in combination, you're, 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 you're in really good shape. Wow. And w- what is actually shadow and what are the values you're talking about in... Uh, your book, I'm sure. And well, what are the relationship of shadow and values? Okay, there's, a, there's an interesting question, which we'll probably spend se- seven or eight hours speaking about. <laughs> but let me see if I can summarize it for you. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, In two minutes. <laughs> okay, two minutes. Sh- shadow are all the aspects of ourselves that we are refusing to own. Uh-huh. And, and they appear to us as repetitive emotional states. Uh-huh. So, for, for instance... Um, Shadow can contain both positive and negative aspects of, of, our, of ourselves. And what happens is we will see other people as reflecting who we are, but we will tend to deny that about ourselves. So, for instance, we may see other people as frustrating, or maybe we even see life as frustrating or life 
as challenging. And what those emotions and those responses are telling us is that we are the ones who are frustrated. We are the ones who are challenged. We are the ones who are angry. And we need to reintegrate that or to be humble enough to own 